welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes. Welcome to a very special edition of Danny G Live. This version is being recorded. I have my guest today with me, Teresa Ruth Howard, and she is a busy, 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 fabulous diva. So we are recording this on Wednesday, I believe it's July 21st, for today's episode. So this is pre-recorded, so this is not live, live, but all good. And yes, my special guest today is Teresa Ruth Howard, who I've known Teresa since my teens. Like she's one of my longest, dearest friends. We went to high school together in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We're actually born on the same day, October 8th. They're both Libras. And so just had a great time being friends with her, growing up, taking dance class with her and being friends all these years later and just watching her tremendous career over all these years. So I'm going to read some of her bio and then I will bring her into the screen. So again, thank you for joining me today for Danny G Live. And yes, Teresa Ruth Howard began a professional dance career with the Philadelphia Civic Ballet Company at the age of 12. She later joined the Dance Center of Harlem where she had the opportunity to travel extensively throughout the United States, Europe, and Africa. She has worked with choreographer Donald Burr as a soloist in his staging of New York City Opera's Carmina Burana, in his critically acclaimed Harlem Nutcracker, as well as the controversial domestic work, The Beast. In 2004, she became a founding member of Armitage Gone Dance and was invited to be a guest artist with Complexions Contemporary Ballet's 10th anniversary, anniversary season, Love Our Complexions Babies. Teresa has been a member of the ballet faculty at the Ailey School for over 18 years. She has been an artist in residence at Hollins University and New Haven University, in addition to teaching at Sarah Lawrence College, Marymount, Shenandoah University, University of the Arts in our hometown, and the Historical American Dance Festival. Teresa has educated arts competitions and taught in Russia, Italy, Canada, and Bulgaria, Bulgaria, and Bulgaria. She has taught at the Joffrey Ballet School in New York, as well as co-facilitating a body awareness workshop in the Jazz Contemporary Division of the program. As a writer, if you haven't seen Teresa's writings, you owe yourself to look her up, look all this up and find her writings because they're incredible. As a writer, Teresa has contributed to The Source, Point Magazine, Dance Magazine, Germany's Tons, and Italy's Expressions. She is a contributing writer for Dance Magazine Online. Her articles about body image prompted her to create MyBodyMyImage.com, which endeavors to help others build a positive body image through respect, acceptance, and appreciation. Her article, The Mysterious Case of the Vanishing Ballerinas of Color, Where Have the where have all the others gone, was a subject of race and dance town hall, real talk at the Dance USA conference in June, 2015. Teresa launched mobballet.org, digital, digitally archiving um, black uh, memoirs of blacks in ballet. That's her foundation she also founded, which I wanna ask her more about as well. One of the first projects for MOB was to help organize and facilitate the first ever audition for black female ballet dancers from major ballet organizations at the 2015 International Association of Blacks in Dance Conference. MOB Ballet is a 2016 Knight Foundation grantee for the documentation of Philadelphia's black ballet history. So, oh my God, and she's my friend and she's here today. So come on in Teresa Howard to the screen. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yes, Diva. I a few words. I'm so sorry about that, but this is extensive and impressive. <laughs> Come on. Look, and I feel like before we even start, I feel the same way about you. Like <laughs> to watch. I mean, we were ridiculous children. Yes. We were fabulous children. Diva Crossing, remember? Across Broad Street, but to you know, like watching your career as well, both as a dancer, a musician, now in your curatorial um, realm, it's just it's really amazing. And this is really, yes. really amazing. So you know, yes. Well, I appreciate power. that about you. You look gorgeous. We just spoke a little bit before, but you look gorgeous. You know, the head is sitting, is snatched, the skin is glowing. So just for folks that aren't aware of who you are and what you've done over the years. Tell us where you are, how you've been, 
and what you're up to today. Well, it's so funny because at the beginning of the, of the, the coronavirus lockdown, I started the C Corona Chronicles. I didn't keep mine going because I got too busy. <laughs> but you were one of my first people that I interviewed and we were so emotional. It was crazy, right? <laughs> so emotional. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm good. I, I, this past year and a half, has like accelerated the work that I was doing in the field in terms of, you know, advocating for uh, more diversity in the field of ballet and then expanded to opera um, as well. And um, it's just been an incredible opportunity to be kind of like secluded. I might call myself Cheney in the bunker, like in the <laughs> out, I moved in. And I've just been able to use this period of time to kind of brainstorm and like really just crank out stuff that would have taken me probably years to mm -hmm. figure out, um, mm -hmm. including, you know, we launched the, the um, Constellation Project in February, which was, you know, an incredible partnership between Williams College um, and Ma Ballet. And um, yeah, I'm just up to, I'm up to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was saying earlier that I want people to um, just for for both of us. So yes, so Teresa and I went to um, the Performing Arts School in Philadelphia, which at that time was associated or attached to what is now known as University of the Arts. So I mean, back then we had a who's who of ballet teachers, but what I'm seeing from like Barbara Sandonato, Alexa Udenich, Andrew Papp, I mean, the dean with Marion Tonner, right? Yeah. And for, for modern, we had the great Pearl Schaefer. Yeah. But when I met you, I think maybe you were 13, 14, right? To my yeah. 15, 16 or whatever. But so you were already dancing at 12. Yeah, well, I think actually you probably met me, we probably met at when I was 12. Okay. Because it was, it was then, because you remember Civic Ballet Company was in the building where the old Capitol was. Uh, okay. And I forget his name, but Gregory, somebody who's at the college, you know, we were all too fast and grown for our own, <laughs> just hanging out like adults. Just grown. Um, I would hang out with this guy named Gregory. I can't remember his last name. He was like, let's go audition for Civic Ballet. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, you know, I go. And I was always tall. Mm -hmm. So I never looked my age. So right. they, they hired me and I was like, well, I'm 12. And they were like, you know. Oh my gosh. So I worked with them for a summer. At the end of that summer, I remember Alicia uh, Craig, who's our artistic director and the founder. Yes. He was saying all the stuff to my father, like, oh, we're going to have her compete and we're going to have her. And I had this, it's so funny how we're always who we are. Mm -hmm. I have this real aversion to like people thinking they own me. Mm, say that one more time for the people in the back. I had a real aversion to people thinking that they owned me. Like yes. she felt like I was hers and mm. she was all of a sudden going to decide what my career, my trajectory, like she was gonna, oh, like this is mine. Right. And I was like, oh no, thank you. And I remember her telling my father, oh, she's so unprofessional. I was like, I'm 12. Right. Like, I'm school. Wow. I'm 12, I'm not yours. Exactly. So, um, however, Mary. So let me. Yeah. So did you get that? Did, I'm sorry. Did you get that sense of agency from your parents? That came from your parents. Um. Yeah. You know, it's really funny. Part of it is just kind of like me. I'm the baby of nine. Oh my goodness, that's right. So I have. I've always been a little advanced. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I've always been up in a conversation with a cup of coffee. <laughs> right. Like six months. <laughs> um. <laughs> And my, my parents, specifically my father, always spoke to me as if I was a full human, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I never, like, I always was able to, I don't know how they, maybe, I, I think I'm the only one in my family's a baby. Maybe they're just tired. Um, but <laughs> I made my own decisions, right? Like, yes. I chose my schools. I mm -hmm. chose whether I wanted to dance or not. Oh, wow. I, yeah, like it was very, I was, I was given sort of that agency. I was always allowed to speak my mind respectfully. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is where I get this healthy debate. <laughs> this right. idea for debate. Like I yes. always feel like I have a right to say. That's whatever. amazing. Because yeah. most people don't have that, especially dancers. This is right. why ballet was a very difficult space for me. Well, tell me, so 
I feel like I know you, but in these conversations with people I've known for years, I'm finding out even more, which I think is such a gift and so magical about doing these conversations. So you said you chose dance or about, when did you become aware of dance and know that that's what you wanted to do or that you had any talent in it? Really funny. Okay, so baby of nine, five sisters. Mm -hmm. All of them went to Phil Danko. <sighs> the, <sighs> the chain, right? Yes. Um, and I followed in their footsteps. Mm -hmm. But I remember being eight and I was dancing with like the 16 year olds. Mm. Um, and I was a little bitty thing then. And we had Marion Suget. Marion Suget. Marion Suget used to teach, you hear Dolores Brown talk about mm -hmm. her teaching from the book. And at 15 minutes, we had pedagogy. We had to buy that book and read that book. And at eight, I loved, like I could, I loved, I love the science of it. Mm -hmm. I just remember being in class and looking at her and saying, I need to get this. Mm -hmm. what I'm gonna be doing. You know, mm -hmm. like, I, like I need to really, yeah. yeah. I just, it was, it was an innate sort of understanding mm -hmm. and connection mm -hmm. with it. And it was specifically ballet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because- Why I'm, do you think? There's something about the order. Yeah of it that my mind liked and like the I like the science and the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of it that and I think that that's what with what um we could call her Madame Suget was offering us is like you can really get into understanding and knowing it in your mm -hmm. body so mm -hmm. when I got to teachers like Lupe so like she was the one who told my father um you should take her to Pennsylvania Ballet because she really it's Mary and Suje. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so interesting to me. I'm so glad we went down this road because as we know, Mary and Suje, very fair skin and all of this. We talk about her a lot and passing, not passing, all that stuff, right? Yeah. She, knowing the difficulties with, you know, Black women in ballet, will send you or suggest Pennsylvania yeah. Ballet. Yeah. So what's interesting about all of and again, like when I did the, and still they rose, the legacy of Black Philadelphians in ballet, <laughs> the installation that's on my ballet. When I was interviewing Aunt Joan and, yes. Jesus and Dolores Brown about their teachers and, and their becoming, mm -hmm. Danny, it really, I got a better understanding of like, oh, this is why I am this way. Like yes. I, I saw, I understood the DNA Mm. Right, like the genetics of what it is to be a, a black Philadelphian mm -hmm. is a very specific specific thing. And the thing that was interesting about uh, uh, Marion Suget is that because even though she was she was fair, her family did not pass. Mm -hmm. She passed when she needed to, like when she was going to get a lease for a studio. But right. she would be very quick to tell you, "I'm just as black as you." Okay. And a couple yes. of her up in there. As well. she, yes. she liked colorful language. Yes. But she, there's a letter from George Chaffe that, it, you know, that, it, that is on my site where he's talking about them building a, the first black ballet dancer. Mm. Like there was this thing where like they were going to crack this code mm -hmm. and they were going to try to figure out not only how to train this black ballet, dancer, like, but, but to place them that one day this will right. be a and I think that Aunt Joan had that as well. Absolutely. So what I find really fascinating, because you know how like smaller dance studios can get very possessive with students. Mm -hmm. They were not that way mm. when it came to potential ballet dancers. They would be like, go, go. Because they wanted that mold to be broken. Yeah. They wanted, yes. They wanted, yes, they, they wanted to, to make sure that if there was one that they could get through, Mm. They were going to stand in the way of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I still went to, I went to Pennsylvania Ballet, but I also, I think I took my, my little pomeranians <laughs> and pancakes. So I did for a while. Yeah. Until I had to, until I got, you know, it was like four or five days a week, six days a week. Yeah. But yeah, it was a, that's a very, um, they were women on a mission. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote that piece, um, about um deborah chase hicks yeah right? i thought it was so important to understand mm -hmm. what 
what it is to have that sort of sense of community and mission, mm-hmm. right? Like that you're stuffing yeah. stuff into yeah. people in hopes that like the world will shift. Right. Eventually. And then they'll be ready. Then the, right. I mean, I gotta say, I'm so glad you wrote that article on 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 Debbie, um, our beloved Debbie, and thank you for also including me. Um, and you know, I will link all of these articles to my my link tree. Also, the one that was just written about you in um, New York Times last oh. August by Siobhan yeah. Burke, and just. I mean, you have truly become a force of nature in this sort of DEI landscape and, and you've been fighting for and talking about it for so long. And I also, because I, I know some of your stories because I, we did that panel in 2016 about the yeah. Black Ballerina. It was very powerful as yourself, Christina Johnson, Joe Myers Brown, uh, Brenda Dixon Gottschild moderated. That was great. That was great. Uh, Francesca Harper. I mean, that yeah. was a moment. I got to go back and find those photos and post them before this this airs, but even, you know, going to Pennsylvania Ballet, retelling that story about um, being cast in the Nutcracker and then finding out that you had to share the role with some little white girl and you thought it was all yours and you you were finally accepted right. in all this. And so at what point did you say, you know what, enough is enough. I'm, leave, I'm leaving this to go explore other things like Dance Theater of Harlem, so to speak. You know, it's really interesting. My first, uh, connection with Dance in Har- Harlem happened around the same time that I went to Pennsylvania Ballet. Mm. Uh, Dance in Harlem came to uh, Philadelphia with a show called Doing It. <laughs> and, doing it. Doing it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> and on the poster, it's like an outline drawing of a woman with like a big afro and she's like stepping. Really? Yes. yes. This is this. This is the genius of Arthur Mitchell. And we can yes. say a lot of things about him. But let me tell you what he did. Mm-hmm. He it was it was a show an extravaganza <laughs> that had ballet infused with like they had everything in there like a gospel choir was in there. He had yes. secular music right so that people would come. Angela Bowfield was in that show. Wow! Before wow. she became famous. Wow! And so it was a, a marketing thing so that like. You know, even if you didn't like classical ballet, if you didn't know what it was, right. you'd be coming for this choir, right? You'd right. Other- Very smart. Yes. Mm-hmm. And in, even smarter, in every city that they went to, they auditioned local children. Oh my God. Right? That's brilliant. So my father's like, I don't know how Walter T heard about this. He's like, come <laughs> on. I'm like, what's going on? He's always pulling me somewhere. So I'm getting to the back of the car, our mover. <laughs> I pull on my tights, but always having yeah. fun. Yeah. So audition at the, I guess it was the Schubert or the, I think it was the Schubert Theater. And mm-hmm. there were 200 kids there. He chose 12. I was one of the 12. Oh my so, God. Yeah. So at the top of the second half, we, the, the ballet children came out and we did like a ballet bar. Mm-hmm. And we were paid. And he said, now that you're paid, you are professional. <laughs> Wait, girl, how much were you paid? I don't know. Two hundred dollars for the whole. Yes. Thing. Okay. okay. Um, and you know, I got to see the dancers close up, right? So yes. My first time seeing all like this cornucopia of of black people who like to yes. do. What I like to do. Yes. And like they were gorgeous. I remember Kara Crawford had this like candy apple red lip gloss mm. on, and I just remember just like like being like, what? is this and I never yeah. wanted to dance anywhere else part of our pay part of our payment was a, a scholarship to go to the summer session oh wow now clearly at eight years old that was not happening right and, but at, at, at 13 it did and so okay. I, when I went and I put on those brown tights and I saw I was like okay this is home yes I never wanted to dance anywhere else like I just wow. never wanted to dance anywhere else I wow knew that, I don't know whether it was being sheltered, I don't know, sheltered, or I don't know what it was. It was yeah. one of those things that I just, I just knew mm-hmm. somehow. And like, you know, things get a little just derailed or whatever by the time I graduated, because he wanted me to stay. In yeah. The Again, I was tall. People always forgot. I was like, I have to go to school. Right. And he would always give like my money, the money that was for that would have paid for professional children's school yeah. to some boy. It was always some boy. Oh, no. I, I went home, you know, and then, then when I graduated high school, 
Yeah. I went, I, I finally went back. Right. So, yeah. so, so I tell me this, this connection to dancing problems. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I mean, I'm just, because I never really knew Mr. Mitchell. I mean, I met him once or twice, but it was always in passing and I was too scared to be like, hi, Mim. Right. I was in one um, workshop with him. I, f- I think we were on tour. I can't even remember, but he came to teach. And I'll just never forget him saying, you know, about closing our fits. You know, mm-hmm. like, it's like having a bad fit is like being in a beautiful ball gown with like crappy shoes. You know, like, <laughs> you're, okay, like your fit needs it, right? And so just briefly touch on, you know, just being able to work with him, being in the room with that man and his genius and his, his, his controversial self. I mean, his difficult self at times too, but I look at some of those leaders like even like a Joe Myers Brown. Mm-hmm. And I think about all that they had to do yes. and fight through mm-hmm. to get there where they are and what, they, what they've given to us. And, and you, you hope at some point, like even for Aunt, our Aunt Joan, that, you know, she can relax into her, into her, you know, her twilight and just not have to fight so hard, right. you know? Right. But I think that some of their, you know, uh, the causticness, if you will, there's a nice way of saying it, just comes out of their experiences for having to fight so hard, both as dancers themselves, you know, I'm not sure what Mr. As human beings. As right? human beings, but now I'm trying to run, you know, somewhat successfully these Black dance companies. So just what were some of the jewels or, or criticisms or things he would say to push, propel you guys forward? Before I, before I go into that, I want to touch on that because I think this is a really important thing that you just brought up. Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, and I had my, look, I'm not special, but I've had my back and forth with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But I made a, a decision coming into this, like doing this work, like really when I started, because I fell into it, right? And it started to evolve. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I started opening it up the way that mm-hmm. I did, I was like, you know what? I am going to reframe the conversation or at least my conversation around Arthur Mitchell. And that mm-hmm. I get that he, that did, he was a difficult man. Right. I'm not, that is an incomplete. Right. Relationship. Right. Because if we're thinking about the era of his becoming mm-hmm. and the idea that what, like what, who did, who did he have to be? Mm-hmm. to command the respect right. of the people that he was either asking money from, that he mm-hmm. was being promoted or presented by. I mean, you're a present, like, you know, like mm-hmm. the idea of a, that conversation, mm-hmm. the way that his respectability politics, like he was never a unkempt. He was always at fresh cut. Right. Knee clothes. Yes. Like you never saw him undone. The mm-hmm. energy that it must have taken. Mm-hmm. To hold that all together and not mm. even just for himself but then mm. take and hold that whole organization it's like a force of nature mm-hmm. so i'm not like he, he he was who he was fully but we don't talk about white artistic directors and founders that way Absolutely not. Right? We don't talk oh, no, about they're geniuses, you know. Oh, we talk about visionaries and his pe- peccadillos and his whatever. <laughs> we don't talk about uh, uh, Elliot Feld and mm. people. Oh, he's difficult. Like he is. But we don't. We don't. That's we don't lead with that. Right. Right. Uh, we don't talk about Twyla Tharp that way. Right. We could go on. Yeah. Jerome Robbins. We don't talk yeah. about about people mm-hmm. white creator mm-hmm. and, and founders that mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. right and that's a part of their madness that makes them so great and everything yeah but like that oh he's difficult he was this that and the other mm-hmm. but that's even going into the the real base language of or situation with black women period you know the minute we demand respect yeah. or command respect we're difficult, difficult we're angry black women we're right. just asking for the saying that you, she got over there or just you're not going to talk to me right. that way now now i'm difficult <laughs> right now now arthur mitchell was of his generation yes so it was a generation where the 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 things that we consider to be po- politically correct mm-hmm. right and and all the sensitivities were definitely not there 
Mm -hmm. But he was also trying to literally mold you into what you needed to be to be successful mm. anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. he, he knew like him, Terry Belafonte, uh, uh, Cicely Tyson, all right. like, that was the, his cohort. They knew how to speak and the comportment that would demand respect from whiteness. Mm. And that is not arrived at oftentimes with a tender hand. Right. We talk about black parenting, right? Mm -hmm. In a way. And there was a whole mm -hmm. bit of that Oprah back in the day where she was talking about parenting. And there was a woman that stood up and said, if I don't discipline my black son, I don't want somebody else disciplined. Exactly. Him. Yeah. That's the reality. Now we're understanding. Like, mm -hmm. Now we're having this open conversation. Right. Institutionalized racism. Right. How that presents. Mm -hmm. We can understand. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, people like Arthur Mitchell and Aunt Joan and 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 Ann Wilson and and Cleo, we can understand them and frame them differently. Yes. I think it's really important. It is. It always detracts. Mm -hmm. from what he actually created mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right the time period that he was creating that mm -hmm. um, it's for me that's one of the things that I'm like really I'm like oh, okay you know what I'm going to change this and whenever somebody speaks of it in my yeah. book I go no we're not gonna do that <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah when you when you because I'm sorry if I don't remember the tra trajectory of the story but leaving DTH was that was that part of when the, the company went on furlough? Was it your own choice? Did you want to go somewhere else? Yeah, well, we had, we had, I got hired after, officially after the furlough, because I was going to Um, But unfortunately, the, the oasis that I thought that Dance Theater of Harlem was going to be for me, mm. it was not. Mm. Um, being completely who I am. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, all this. All this. Wait, I had, to, I had to get my fan. And, and all of this. Okay. Um, it was very hard for me to suppress mm. what I knew to be myself. Yes. Because I was actually fully formed as a human. Mm. Like, oftentimes, oftentimes in ballet, you're not fully formed. Right. Right. But because of that, that odd trajectory, because I went to the private performing arts and I went to the public performing arts, you know, oh wait, my mother put me in the Christian Academy for a couple of years after hanging out with you. And, and <laughs> so my fault. Out, I would just be like, I'm going to go over your house. My mother would not know where I was. <laughs> Remember that crazy. Yes. That so wrong. Now that I think about it, I was like, that was wrong. Um, <laughs> But, and then having, having that time yeah. where before I, if I had been on that trajectory mm -hmm. that was common, that would have been like, oh, you go to professional children's school mm. and then you're dancing. I would have never, I would have never understood that I liked writing, for instance. Yeah. Because, you know, like I would have never had that. So I was, mm -hmm. and for my household, I was very clear. So you weren't ever going to tell me mm -hmm. who I wasn't. Mm -hmm. They're never going to label me. And this yeah. is where Arthur Mitchell and I. Oh, okay. Yeah. Often bang heads. It was mm -hmm. that also combined with um, the body issue thing. Like yours or his? Like, oh, he had body issues. He had an issue with my body. Well, that's well, interesting. So now we're in a company where you've got all these, like you just said, a cornucopia, beautiful black. So, but there were still the ballet is, body yes this is how i describe it yeah even though it was a, a space of blackness mm. the culture of ballet overrode mm. the culture of blackness mm -hmm. right so the aesthetic of ballet we were still in that right, right? so if you had a, a butt and a thigh right then ooh, ooh. and if we were brown mm. that was also something Mm. And also, I think that with me and Arthur Mitchell, he had an idea of what he wanted me to be mm -hmm. and who he wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I'm going to mold you into. Yeah. When I refused mm -hmm. 
right? That yeah. became problematic. Years later, we had a conversation about it. Yeah. And I was just like, he thought I wasn't serious. He didn't think, I was like, why didn't you just ask me? Why didn't you just pull me aside and say, All right, yeah. Oh, what's going on for you? Yeah. Right? Um, and I had this hip thing. That was the first twinge of it. Oh, wow. But yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a combination of things mm -hmm. that made me leave. And when I left, I didn't want to dance. Oh. Like I didn't, like it would, it, I was like, mm, yo, no, I don't want to, like I should have gone to Frankfurt Ballet or something like that. Uh. But I didn't want to dance. Like I took, I think it was a year and a half maybe mm -hmm. off. And I worked at the Paramount Hotel. Really? And was a normal person, was a regular person for the first time in my Not life. Not even taking classes, nothing. Not a class. <laughs> was like, I have never just not had to worry about sewing a shoe or icing a part of the body or, right. or what I ate. Like, yeah. I, I was just like, this is what it feels like. I was like, oh my God, this is easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Being a normal person, having a normal job, yeah, was easy. What were you doing? Was, were you working at the front desk or something? I was like a uh, 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 hotel operator. <laughs> yes. <Turn out. laughs> How can I direct your call? Yes. Hello, I'm sorry. There's no answer in that room. May I take a message? I hear an answer. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. He's busy with his mistress. <laughs> Well, no, that did happen once. Oh no! <laughs> Someone sent a call into the room, and it came back down. And yeah. they said, "You want to like leave a message for Mr. Black or Miss White?" Oh. So they both put, and she's like, "I am Miss Mrs. White and Mrs. Black or whatever." And she's uh -oh. like, "Oh, would you like this message?" And the woman said, "Divorce." <laughs> oh I'm not lying to you. So true. Sure. So that's insane. Okay, so. You, you you take a year off and change. And then how do you, what prompts you back into it? I started having sleeping dreams of, of dancing. Oh, yeah. And then I said, okay, all right. I'm just going to go take class. Yeah. And I found Simon Dow. Oh, nice. Okay. And, and he kind of nurtured me back in. Yes. To, and I would just like, you would have thought that I was like a legger pen because like, you'll know, take class on legger pen. She'd be laughing and talking. About okay. It. Yes. So that's how I was with myself because it didn't yeah. matter. Yeah. And I realized that like, it, it came back like that because at that time. Yeah. Uh, right. I had appreciated it. I had that easy body. <laughs> which the, the, it just is like, yes. and he was like, this is your first class back. I was like, yes. Okay. And literally three months later, I was back on stage with Iglesky Ballet, the, their Nutcracker. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Michael okay. Burnham, right. So it was. I was like, oh, oh, this is your blessing. Yes. And you had to find oh. your joy in it. And I vowed I would never place my gifts before swine, if you will. Mm. I would never really feel that way. Like that joy that yeah. I felt, that's how I was supposed to be yeah. in my body. Mm. And so yeah, I, so, yeah. yeah, I'm so glad I'm talking to you um, this weekend or uh, because, as you know, I had my first show back with Summer Stage on Sunday with all the idols, with all these dance companies. It's a full circle moment, right? It really is, right? Oh, and, really yeah. you know, as I'm watching these dancers and I'm talking to dancers, uh, coming back to it and what they're bringing back to it after everything that we've been through and... I just want to read this because, you know, I, I saw it when you put this out there, you put out this really strong call to action on Instagram after, you know, George Floyd's murder and, you know, demonstrate your outrage. And, and I believe you were talking to white, what our white friends specifically, white, white. white. and we love y'all. We do my brothers and sisters, but I'm going to say it. Demonstrate your outrage, demonstrate your allyship, demonstrate your authenticity. We don't need shadow heroes step into the light. And I Ooh. saw that, it broke me down. I posted something just on my own, just literally standing against this wall right here. I just broken down, you see so much of it. And so part of what, you know, I'm curious with, especially our, our, our black brothers and sister dancers, what are they bringing back with them to the stage? What has this year done to them? Not just loss of income, 
but now we've had time to sit around and think about ourselves more mm -hmm. than just like how many IG likes I can get. We're really able to delve in there. Yeah. What am I bringing back to the stage? What am I saying? What do I want to say? Am I coming back to this company? I might need to move on. I might need to do something different, you know? And so what do you, what do you hope to see in this next year or so? I mean, again, we could go hours talking about all the work you've right. already done in this space. And guys, if you're watching, go to her website, learn all she's done in this space because this has been talked about and done and done again. But what do you, what do you hope to see in this year forward? You know what, I, I, uh, there's so, so much. I, I hope that as a field, mm -hmm. we can begin to honor humanity mm. in our art. That's it. Right, like because right now, like dance and specifically ballet, it's art over everything. So we don't care if you're you're starving yourself. We don't care if you're injured. We don't care if you're happy. And I, that is extreme. And people are like, "Well, it's not yeah. like that for you." Yeah. Know yeah. Right. How do we honor humanity in our art form, which is very odd because we are charged with evoking human emotion. Right. So how are we not really tapped in? the mm -hmm. human emotion and the culture and our mm -hmm. daily culture, yes. right? Like that's what I would love to see. I would love, and I feel like hopefully being at home in your own space, you get to spend a little bit of time with yourself, like time that you're not rushing around and right. packing and yada, 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 and rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And maybe some people have had the time to really kind of nurture, mm -hmm. fill out, color those little empty spaces mm -hmm. and have time to really address, right? Or even engage with while they were training to be the best that they could be. Mm -hmm. I think that that makes us better artists. I think that we create better art, right? Mm -hmm. um, I love the activism. Yes. That, that is coming up. I am concerned on some fronts because this generation is very different. Yeah, And I see sometimes the call out, burn it down, like not realizing that oftentimes you are, you're only seeing the first domino mm. and you tap it and it can set a chain reaction. Right. If you had never thought of. Mm -hmm. And like early on, like after I did that call to action, I was like, okay, so you called them out. What's next? What's your plan? Right. What's next? What's your plan? Because if yeah. you blow something up, where are you going to sleep? Right. Where are you going to dance? Right. Right. Like that's the thing. Yeah. If you if you don't care, mm -hmm. then you blow stuff up. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't care about anybody else because yeah. there's other people who might want to still do that thing. Yeah. So my question is. If you're not part of the solution, mm -hmm. you are a part of the problem. Absolutely. Right? Because, because it's easy to call people out. Yeah. Right? That's step one. Yeah. What is next? Yeah. That's why I, that's why I call myself a, a, a diversity strategist. Because I, I love I, that. I, I, yeah. Um, what's next? We, identifying the problem is the easiest part. Right. Well, what is the problem? That's, that was my next question. I think you were going there because you sit in these meetings, you've moderated these panels, you've brought people together. What are they saying? Are they still holding on to the aesthetic thing or black girls don't show up or that for these audition for these ballet companies? Is that still what they're going with? This is, Danny, this was my frustration when, you know, it went kaboom. Right. Yeah. And nothing is happening. And blah, blah. and I was like, it's like, it's yes. And yeah, right? things are happening. It's mm -hmm. not happening as fast as you want them to. You may not be aware mm -hmm. of what's happening because everything is not, a, it is not visibly taken in. Right. Yeah. Like I, the work that I do, mm -hmm. I say, I work, I don't work on people. I work with people. The mm. work is shifting human being. Yes. That you cannot see. Yeah. You can't see that. Mm -hmm. You can't see how someone's conversation mm -hmm. has changed. Mm. You can't see that someone now questions things mm -hmm. differently, mm -hmm. right? That is actually the work. 
Mm -hmm. You say you don't want tokenism, <laughs> but then you want a visual representation of, of the work. And all the time right. there isn't, it's not, it's not so obvious. Right. So, so yes, and there are some people who are still holding on to aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I say, you know, like the seven stages of grief, we're in bargaining. <laughs> we're in bargaining. Yeah. How much of this do we have to give up? Yes. Oh, okay. Maybe it's pink tight. Mm. And that'll work on people. Why? Because it's visual. Right. But meanwhile, I'm looking at it. Now, this is, this is my new, I, again, it always evolves. Mm -hmm. I look at, at the, the brown tights thing mm -hmm. as low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. Both schools are like, okay, we're going to have you wear the people of the dancers of color can wear brown tights. Right. Awesome. Right. Two problems with that. Mm -hmm. It others the other again. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you have, there are a lot of, of black dancers who are choosing to wear pink tights. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they're the only ones that would be in brown tights. Mm. If you're going to make it a dress coat, make it a dress coat across the board. Right. Just like the Harlem did. We yeah. all wear our flesh tone tights. Mm -hmm. That is what we do. Mm -hmm. The second problem with that in schools is you can make that a dress code in your school. Now you've normalized brown people wearing their flesh tone tights. If your artistic director has not adopted that in the company, then what is the point? There was the point exactly. Because now the little girl goes and she goes on, she's on stage. She, there's a black girl in the company. She's wearing pink tights. That's cognitive dissonance. Right. Yeah, right. right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So for me, my job is always, yes, don't get me wrong. I am happy that dress codes are changing. Yes. I see it as my job to constantly up the ante. Because mm -hmm. it's not, that's not done. We're not yeah. done. Yeah. Oh, we're no, we're close to being done. Right, but we need to negotiate. Yeah. Like, don't, that's a, that's a sparkly thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> cool. I'm like, okay, but is, are there brown tights in the company? Right. Like, how far are we doing this? How are we negotiating that? What's the conversation? Mm. We understand that aesthetic choice mm -hmm. in relationship to the historical, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, reference mm -hmm. that pink tights mm -hmm. represents, or right. is it, do you see what I'm saying? Like, yes. maybe that's a little too intellectual. No, 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 absolutely not. No, this is great, because it also makes me wonder, when, when you say you go into the top of, yeah, the school might be one way, but then you get to the artistic director who hasn't truly evolved or, you know, come to that moment or, has, or doesn't see that as an aesthetic that he would want yeah. to have the company in right yeah and and again I, I honor the process of people getting there but yeah. my thing is I want organizations mm. to be really mindful mm -hmm. of the choices that are even the great choices that they're making yeah you have to be able to walk that concept all the way down the field oh right so, yeah. We're doing that in the school and that's yeah. really great. And, and, and what is the trajectory? What is the philosophy mm -hmm. behind, you know, flesh tone tights in sure. the right. and the company? But you also, to your point earlier about the domino effect, right? So yes, the tights, the school and everything. And it's also, it's also fear, fiscal fear. You know who's running these companies? Who's on these boards that that might you know? Okay, we we see your little movement over there, but this <laughs> is the company. Okay, so there could be that higher ring wrong, whatever we don't even know about. That's saying we don't want it. Our it's audiences so don't want it. <laughs> it's so funny. This is I, I now I I'm probably have worked with at least. 30 to 40 companies yeah. around the world. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. They're almost all different. All of them. Wow. Literally. I call it the, the, the triad of power mm -hmm. in America because the European is on, they're on a whole different system mm -hmm. right now. So in, in America, the, that board of directors, AD, ED, right? Executive director, artistic director. That, the power 
is different and the way it plays out, it's different in every company. Right. So you can't put a blanket fix mm. because it plays out differently. Yeah. Makeup of the board, right? Our boards even engage, they understand what's happening in the com company mm -hmm. in terms of company culture. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is what makes it tricky. Yeah. Because it, it, it can't just be like, let's pass these leaflets out and we're all yeah. we're all set. Right, exactly. But do you so also do you also ever hear them saying our audiences won't accept it? Do you ever hear get that? Sure, but but and in part that could be true. Mm -hmm. And it might not be true. Right. But you don't know that until you program that. Right? Exactly. So your your current audience yeah. might not. Yeah. But what happens when you put something else? on stage oh you get a different audience so which absolutely about so we have to be really courageous in yes. trying different things right mm -hmm. we understand being courageous when you want a a well-known choreographer we can spend millions of dollars on a ballet that is a flop that ends up yeah. being a flop that is a huge risk right this is the norm mm -hmm. we understand risk when it aligns with our sensibilities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's a value system. Yeah. I'm willing to invest in that person because mm -hmm. I have the belief that potentially mm -hmm. that can work. Yeah. However, yeah. we have seen million dollar flops. Flops, <laughs> right. One season, huge ballets set, right? Mm -hmm. Think about the value system, mm -hmm. right? When you talk, oh God, oh, they don't know if they'll come. Okay, they didn't come to that either. Right. Come to a lot of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. So yeah. It's just about the way that you are, are, are looking at it, your perception yeah. of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Right. Like if you really, if we really looked at it, you're like, there are programs that just don't sell. Right. And I'm not saying that we want to be programming stuff that we know, oh, this isn't going to sell. Let's do <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. But, but to your point though, it, like we're educating our audiences. Like we, we right. Mm -hmm. We're and telling you know them. Better, you know this because yes. this is your business. Yeah. Right. And you also know how to market. Right. You, you, that is a science. We need to get better at yeah. not doing that same thing, but mm. trying it other ways. Okay. Like for instance, you know, uh, Pittsburgh Valley Theater did this um, partnership with Nancy the Harlem. I think they did it twice, twice in a row, two years mm -hmm. in a row. And when they did it, their audiences were highly diverse. Mm. Right. When without the partnership, the audiences go back to looking like the way that they <laughs> Right, right. This is data. Exactly. Right. If we present different things, then different people will come. Exactly. So this is like a note to us about the stories we tell. You know, definitely the bodies that are, are on the stage, the collaborations that we build. Right. It's just that that we need to just shake it up. Yeah. And and look, I feel like since Corona took us down to the studs anyway, <laughs> we might as well, you know, it's a blueprint. Be like, we always wanted a second bedroom. Let's right. <laughs> Now's the time. That's how I feel. Yeah. That's how I feel, but I don't, I don't run an organization but my own. Like, you know, like, <laughs> but, but Danny, I mean, there's a part of it that goes, okay, well, if, if we really want this change, then you can't change and stay the same. Exactly. But then there's yeah. some, there's like us too. Like we've got to show up. Oh, absolutely. Because you know yeah. how to do something. <laughs> I do know how we do. So, I mean, this, I mean, I'm literally looking at the time. I'm so sorry. And this could go on for another, as, we'll have to come back for a part two. Cause this is a, obviously more to talk about with this <laughs> topic and you yourself. So in these last, you know, five minutes or so, just, what is up next for you in your writings, in your, you know, your cross country moderating and panels and all of it? Are you traveling yet? Um, I'm about to go to Hawaii on like 
I'm gonna call it a vacation because I'm working <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I'm taking a, a much needed break. Yes. Um, but there's a lot of great stuff coming up, like mm-hmm. you know, the Kennedy Center in next June curated yes. um, with Denise Saunders Thompson. Oh, that's I, right, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's gonna be an exciting project. The mm-hmm. Constellation project is now going to be back at Williams and at Princeton. Mm-hmm. And um, I believe Stockton is offering it as a um, an independent study. So that's great. Um, so you're seeing constellation like stars? Yeah, like the constellation project that's on the, the our website that is the intersection. Okay, that's what I was gonna ask. So it's on your website. So if they go right. to lawballet.org, they can find all right. this stuff, right? So, our, okay. so mm-hmm. that should explode with maybe seven more orbits. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm doing more consultation. I have a, a, a project that I'm launching in January. I'm not going to say what it is, but you have to come back. <laughs> wherever I see a problem, I try to devise a solution. Yes. And so this, this next project is a solution to the next step of the work for the work mm-hmm. that's being done. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to weave everything in. Oh, and in August, 2022, I think I'm going to do the next symposium live. In yes. Miami. Yeah, in Miami. Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> so I'm up to. I'm always. I'm always busy. Oh my god. So this has been incredible. And again, there's so much more to learn and talk about. But you've you've been already been doing so much of the legwork. So listen, listen, Linda. Listen, guys. Please <laughs> go to the link mobballet.org in my in my link tree. Learn more about the work that Teresa is doing, has been doing. It's really important and relevant work. And it just tells our stories and more of them need to be told. And we will continue to support her. There's a donation link as well on her website. So donate to the cause, donate to the cause. Um, And so we're going to stay on this a little bit longer so we can get down and dirty and gossip. You know that. (laughs) But also too, thank you guys as always for watching. And again, this Sunday in Central Park Summer Stage is my first and only Summer Stage dance offering. Dance is... And I named it that because I feel like what does dance, what is dance to you? Dance is for me life. Dance is everything. So please come if you can. If you can't make it out to the par, which hopefully you can, it will be also live stream. Doors open at five. The show is at seven. And it's a cornucopia of dancers and companies of every discipline, every shape, size, color, and everything. So, I'm so happy for you. I'm, <laughs> happy for you. I'm happy for them. You know what I mean? I've been working. So I'm just happy to be able to give this platform coming out of this. Well, we're still in it. Yeah. Pandemic to be able to give work to these dancers and opportunities. And so it's just, it's a blessing. So but your ministry is, is creating <laughs> opportunities literally for people to have a space. And you've lifted up so many artists and so many companies like people. I mean, obviously they're watching this so they know about they know about you but like yeah. that's you you are uh an incredible force and the thing is is like and also you're just a party you are just joy <laughs> and, and anything that you do with that joy like mm-hmm. can't help but be successful and yes. so like I just watch when I go like yes <laughs> this is thank you Teresa this is a 30 plus year friendship here guys Born on the same day. I'm a couple yeah. years older, but we are Libra twins, <laughs> my October 8th sister. So <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye for now. Teresa, you're going to stay on. Yeah. And I will hopefully see you guys next Friday live at five o'clock and more to come. So thank you for watching. Go to Teresa's website and I hope to see you all on Sunday in Central Park. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and.